as folks um, trickle in. So um, hi everyone, I'm Archie Pollum. Um, I'm an assistant professor in radiation oncology here at Stanford. I also run the um, radiation oncology medical student clerkship here. Um, this is, um, yeah, welcome to Rover. This is a program that I, along with Jenna Khan at OHSU, she'll be joining um, later in the session, um, we created this last summer when everything was shut down during COVID to um, just help um, supplement oncology education for medical students. Um, and it was really well received. Um, we had a great summer series and um, we wanted to continue it this summer um, and hopefully every summer going forward, um, just to leverage the virtual environment to improve connectivity and access, uh, no matter where you are, or what institution you're at. And so um, today's our kickoff session for our second summer series. Um, the topic is GI cancers. Um, we're gonna be having these sessions every two weeks. Um, we'll invite about three or four faculty from um, academic radiation oncology departments across the country. We'll have a resident moderator go through um, three or four cases at each of these sessions and have the panelists um, weigh in and discuss them and um, provide some teaching points. Um, the session is meant to be interactive, so um, please enter any questions you have as we go through the cases um, in the chat box and make sure you address the chats to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can benefit from your questions and the answers. Um, we'll try to bring up the questions as they come up for discussion, um, but the faculty um, feel free to also answer them in the chat box. We'll also have some poll questions throughout so um, you all can participate and answer. Um, I think that's it, so let's get started. I think we'll start with introductions. Um, so Chris, is our moderator, maybe um, you can start with telling um, the group a little bit about yourself and why you went into radiation oncology, and then we can move on to the panelists up as well. Sure, yeah. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. I'm a fourth year, soon to be fifth year, uh, radiation oncology resident at Oregon Health Science University. Um, went into radiation oncology originally uh, as a roundabout out of uh, ENT, which I was orig originally interested in, in head and neck surgery. Um, but I was intrigued just because of the diversity of disease sites that you can treat um, and how in the clinic you have to work with many different teams from folks who are looking through um, very different lenses. Um, and, and so, and also it was, it was great to see that you could follow patients longitudinally um, those things drove me to the field. Great. So maybe we can um, start with um, uh, Dr. Henke. Sure. So I'm Lauren Henke. Um, I'm an assistant professor of radiation oncology at WashU in St. Louis. And Similarly to Chris, I um, was really attracted to radiation oncology by the diversity of the things that we're able to do in our practice. Um, I've always really liked imaging. I was a, a gymnast growing up, so I tore and broke a lot of things and, and was on the receiving end of a lot of radiology. Um, but I couldn't fathom just being in a dark room all day and not interacting with patients as much. And so RADONC has always seemed and in reality is to me just a great mix of procedures, of clinical work, um, long-term longitudinal relationships with patients, and of course, a lot of cool technology and imaging. All right, I guess I'll go next. I'm Jessica Frakes. Um, I'm the residency program director at Moffitt, and I also, just like the other panelists, treat uh, GI cancers every day. Um, the main pull probably for me for radiation oncology was initially I was interested in oncology um, in general and had never heard about radiation oncology um, until probably the end of my second beginning of third year of medical school and was really driven by the imaging, the fact that you could see something and address it. Um, so I didn't like not to say anything against medical oncology or chemotherapy, but I liked being able to see something and target it. 
Um, and that was a lot more, that was very attractive to me as well as the relationships that you build with your patients and that you can, you know, help patients at the end of their life and help with symptoms and make their quality of life better, but also really be a part of the cure of their cancer. And so I think that was very attractive as well as I have two young kids and it was a great um, career for work-life balance and um, making sure that I have time for my family at home as well. Um, so that's kind of probably what drove me to the field, um, kind of all of those things together. Uh, my name is Ann Raldo. I am an assistant professor at UCLA and I'm also the program director here. Uh, I treat mainly GI malignancies, uh, which is why I hopefully was invited to this panel on GI malignancies. Um, and I went into Radonk um, kind of on a, um, by coincidence. But uh, once I um, was able to rotate, I really loved it. Um, I love the meaningful patient interactions um, and being able to treat meaningful disease. It was really meaningful to me um, to be part of a patient's cancer journey as opposed to just um, doing something like managing blood pressure. I just felt a lot of meaning in it. Uh, and of course, I love the technology at the same time, not having to know um, physics at the level of a physicist, um, just getting to enjoy the technology itself. And um, at the same time, I love the variety of day to day. Um, so we are not always in clinic, but we are in clinic several times a week, or at least I am. But there's a lot of time for treatment planning, research, um, if you're an academic center interacting with residents, uh, etc. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks for the introductions. Um, we will get started. We have a lot to lot to cover. Um, so our first case. This is a 56-year-old uh, um, female. She presents to your clinic with um, right row blood per rectum, uh, as well as rec rectal pain and constipation for three months. No history of colonoscopy. She has diabetes, hypertension, obesity, no inflammatory bowel disease. Um, no meaningful uh, cancer history in her family. She's on metformin. Uh, she has good social support. She's so fully self-sufficient. She's a caretaker full-time. No smoking or alcohol. Like only occasionally walks, but she does admit that she has a low, very low fiber, high processed food diet. Um, and so I'll start with Dr. Hankey. What kind of things are you thinking about um, when you uh, take a history from these folks? So um, I think we kind of are, are surmising in advance that this might be a, a rectal cancer patient. Um, but when you're when you meet somebody in your clinic who is having bright red blood per rectum, um, just from a safety perspective, right away want to ensure that they haven't had bleeding to the degree that they might be hemodynamically unstable. Once you've sort of determined that they have an adequate blood count and everything is is stable, then you're looking for other factors like duration and change of bowel movements, um, change in caliber of bowel movements, if they have any concerning symptoms that would suggest that if they have a cancer, they might be nearing a bowel obstruction from that cancer blocking the lumen of the bowel. And that can be things like straining with bowel movements or frequent but very small caliber stool or feeling of bloating after meals. Um, so those are those are things that you're looking for right away on history um, in terms of really pertinent to the to the presentation. And then, of course, um, I think the past medical history and family history and social history here that are laid out sort of suggest that at key factors that we're looking for um, in terms of potential contributors or risk factors to a disease process. Um. And Dr. Frakes, could you describe your, your physical exam? Yeah, so I think when I would first see this patient in clinic, you know, um, just like Dr. Henke said, you want to make sure they're hemodynamically stable, but I would look for paler or things like that to suggest that they were anemic or had a, a low a red cell count. Um, and I would do a general exam, but focus mostly on the abdominal exam, um, as well as a rectal exam um, in clinic. 
um, you know, recognizing that if it is, you know, you want to make sure there's nothing in the anal canal, but also if it's a low rectal, you may feel something on exam, but if it's higher up, recognizing the rectal exam may not be everything. Um, but I think it's important to do that as well as, you know, a lymph node exam specifically in the groins, um, you know, just to, to make sure that, you know, if this is a cancer, you're not uh, noticing any spread of disease. And so would probably do that, but recognizing it's a 56 year old female. Um, a lot of times I also would do um, a vaginal exam as well, um, and a speculum exam, as well as for sure get a colonoscopy because she's 56 and has never had a prior colonoscopy. And I think that that would um, be part of the, the workup in this patient. Great. So um, she is hemodynamically stable, no pallor um, or dizziness standing. Um, but we do a rectal exam, and there is a palpable mass in the in the uh, mid rectum, about five centimeters from the anal verge. She has good rectal tone, no anal canal involvement. Um, her labs are all normal, but her CEA was was elevated, and we did get a colonoscopy, which um, also showed this um, ulcerating, not obstructing rectal mass. Um, about five centimeters in length. Um, and a biopsy showed moderately differentiated endocarcinoma with MMR intact. And so um, I believe we're back to Dr. Hankey. Um, if you, or are we all Dr. Raldo? Um, what imaging would you, would you recommend in these folks? Um, so now that you have a diagnosis of a malignancy and it is indeed rectal cancer, um, you need to stage that cancer. And part of staging that cancer um, is doing imaging. And what we typically do here um, is a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, just to look for any evidence of metastatic disease. Um, and if the patient's not metastatic, and occasionally if the patient is metastatic, uh, we also do an MRI of the pelvis um, and that MRI is really important because um, it gives us good soft tissue contrast. And so we're able to look at the uh, tumor locally to help us uh, determine the next steps of um, uh, treatment. And that's exactly what we, what we do. So the MRI of the pelvis um, shows this rectal mass that was um, seen on physical exam. There's also multiple uh, perirectal lymph nodes that were visualized. And the CT um, should be chest and abdomen and pelvis shows no uh, metastatic disease. So Dr. Hankey, um, she described how, with the advantages of an MRI and briefly. Yeah, so advantages of an MRI, um, really the difference between a CT and an MRI is in, in the sense of what it offers to you clinically is um, the difference in soft tissue definition. So CT scans um, rely on differences in densities of tissue to drive um, creating a, a re basically a reproduction of the patient's anatomy for you to be able to digitally see. But soft tissue tumors that arise in soft tissues are really hard to distinguish um, in terms of really specific anatomic detail on CT. Whereas MRI, because it doesn't use density information and instead uses um, you know, signaling and, and different um, MRI sequences and magnetic field strengths to, to generate a, a signal in that way, you're able to have a much better soft tissue contrast to just sort of leave it in sim simple terms. And so that's really important in a rectal cancer to be able to see how far through the lumen of the or through the wall of the bowel a cancer might have um, gone, or if it is approaching certain anatomic boundaries that are relevant in rectal cancer, like the mesorectal fascia, which is a surgical plane important for surgery, and then also to to identify and distinguish. Um, what can otherwise be difficult to see mesorectal nodes to, to truly have the best clinical staging that you can. So not only is it just gonna show you the soft tissue in the best way, but specifically to rectal cancer, we're evaluating um, the T stage in terms of depth of invasion through the, the bowel and an extent of local invasion, as well as nodal status using that MRI. And that's key. And could the panelists um, comment on 
a PET CT, one of the um, med students asks, uh, asked, and it's use in rectal cancer workup. And then um, Chris, maybe you can point to the tumor on the images as well. So I think, yeah. Chris, oh, go ahead. In there. Oh, and go ahead. I was just going to say for, so when looking at, someone asked about PET scans um, and what is the use in rectal cancer. And so, you know, I will say at our institution, we used to do PET scans um, for initial staging. Part of it was prior to us doing MRIs. And I think at some point we'll talk about endorectal ultrasound versus MRI. And so as Dr. Henke was mentioning, the, the MRI is giving us the T stage. So for cancers, you think of T stage, which is the tumor, and it could be size, it could be depth of invasion. And so for rectal cancer, it's depth of invasion. So the MRI is giving us the T stage. Then there's the N stage, which stands for lymph nodes. And so also, as Dr. Henke mentioned, we're seeing multiple abnormal uh, perirectal lymph nodes. So that would suggest a clinical node positive patient. And then there's the M stage, which stands for metastasis. And that's what we use to CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis in this rectal case to make sure that it's M0 or no evidence of metastatic disease. If you look at the NCCN guidelines, they're not, they're not requiring a PET scan for rectal cancer. It's not wrong to do a PET scan, but I think at our institution, we only do it if we see something abnormal on a CT scan now that we're doing MRIs. I think when we used to do endorectal ultrasound, we sometimes would do the PET scan in that situation because they weren't having um, a lot more tissue contrast um, for the MRIs. Um, and it's not been used as much for prognostic value like we do in another cancers like anal cancer and other things, sometimes the SUV or how much uptake in the PET scan is seen or how active that cancer could be. Um, is used for prognostic. So we're not doing um, PET scans for rectal cancer, but I'm not sure if every other institution is um, not doing those as well. Um, but hopefully that answered your question as far as a PET scan. I wouldn't say it's wrong, but in our institution, we don't think it adds much value at this point in time. Similarly, we don't often use PET scans or at least don't routinely use them at WashU for rectal cancer. And and like Dr. Frakes was saying, it um, has to do with the different brightness, basically, that you're going to see on a PET scan that can be variable between different types of cancer. And rectal cancer in general is not always brightly avid like some other cancers might be. And um, therefore, we tend to reserve using it for if there's something a bit indeterminate on a CT or an MRI that maybe isn't easily amenable to biopsy, but we're hoping that the PET in this case might have uptake to help us have an answer or not, um, but it's not something I routinely reach for. I also agree it's not wrong to get, but just less commonly helpful. And I think another question someone asked was about the CEA as part of the workup, that there was a CEA drawn. Um, and, and the CEA is a tumor marker. And a lot of cancers express certain tumor markers that can be used for prognostic value of how high they are to begin with. So the higher usually means that it, um, it's a marker that you can follow. Um, and so what you're using the CEA is it does have some prognostic value at diagnosis, but also you're using it for follow-up. And so after the patient has completed treatment, you can follow that CEA to have an early marker of something may be changing or the cancer could be coming back or alternatively, the cancer's gone and things are going in the right direction. Awesome. Um... So for Dr. Raldo, what is the role at your institution of, of TNT or total neoadjuvant therapy? Yeah, so classically uh, rectal cancer uh, was treated um, using uh, neoadjuvant chemoradiation, or I should say locally advanced rectal cancer uh, with either a T3 and or node positive disease was classically treated with neoadjuvant chemoradiation followed by surgery followed by chemotherapy in that sequence. Uh, but recently, um, many studies have evaluated actually moving all treatment up front uh, so that it's done before surgery because patients often after surgery are weak, they have to recover, um, and they're not able to tolerate chemotherapy very well. In addition, um, in the classical treatment paradigm, when you were putting all the you know, big gun systemic therapy at the end, um, you know, there was a concern that there would be microscopic spread of disease um, that wouldn't be addressed until, you know, months down the line. 
So there have been uh, numerous studies recently that have evaluated the role of TNT or total neoadjuvant therapy, where the radiation and the chemotherapy is um, put up front. And there's many different types of sequences and, uh, of chemotherapy with radiation that have been studied uh, in addition to short course radiation versus the classical form of long course chemo radiation. Um, it's all a bit confusing to all of us, to be honest. Um, there isn't, um, the, the to different total neoadjuvant treatments haven't been compared to each other head to head um, as much. Uh, but here at UCLA, uh, our practice pattern is typically to do short course radiation therapy, followed by uh, about 16 weeks of uh, full FOX or KPOX chemotherapy, uh, followed by surgery. Uh, that is our preferred practice here at UCLA, not to say we don't do other types of total neoadjuvant therapy, uh, but that's our preferred regimen. And that is based on a recent publication called the Rapido study. Great, I think that answered some of the future questions. Um, so we recommended, um, Oh, looks like there is a poll question. Chris, I think you can go ahead while we wait for the responses to come in. Okay. Um, so we recommended uh, pre-op chemo radiation therapy. Um, and in this case, uh, total mes mesorectal excision followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. So Chris, just to answer one of the questions that came through of if there's no evidence of the cancer spreading or metastasis, why don't we start with surgery um, without doing the radiation, I think was one of the questions that was asked. And, you know, I think to answer that question briefly, um, if you do not do the radiation, there's an increased risk of local regional recurrence. And so it really has to do with preventing the cancer from coming back. And this is specifically for locally advanced cancer, just like Dr. Raldo had mentioned. If this was a earlier stage, can stage cancer, you may not do radiation. But in this case, if we omit the radiation, we are increasing the local regional recurrence by you know about double. So it reduces the recurrence risk by about half. Um, it, at this point in time, doesn't always improve survival if it is the right surgery is done, which I think we'll talk about a little bit later in this uh, pre presentation. And just to add to that, it's always, or at least in rectal cancer, um, easier to do radiation before surgery as opposed to after. If you think about your treatment volumes uh, beforehand, a lot of that tissue that you're treating is going to come out in the surgery, um, but and we have techniques to you know push small bowel and other organs at risk out of the treatment field. If you do surgery first, um, a the patient has to recover from surgery. Um, B um, because you're taking out so much, um, well you're taking out the total mesorectum, small bowel will fall into your field. Um, and more healthy tissue will end up in the radiation field, which can lead to more side effects. Awesome. Um, and Dr. Heike, if you don't mind, could you touch on um, what TME is in basic terms and, and how that's changed uh, surgical management? Yeah, so a total mesorectal excision is exactly as it sounds. It's removing the entire mesorectum, ideally an, an intact piece along the, the mesorectal fascial plane. And that is um, really important in mitigating risk of local failure. Um, if a surgeon isn't carefully following that fascial plane and doesn't have a smooth resection plane, um, that alone can increase the risk of, of local failure because they may inadvertently leave uh, microscopic or even gross disease behind. Um, in the past, when people didn't use that technique, um, then that was actually a setting in which using radiation actually improved 
survival itself, which is actually not something we typically think of radiation as helping to achieve in rectal cancer. We're really about helping reduce the risk of local failure, assuming that the surgeons are doing this now standard of care surgical technique of a total mesorectal excision. But if somebody were going to use a really outdated uh, surgical technique that's not as oncologic as we, as we say, um, then um, that places the patient at, at higher risk of poor outcomes. Great. Um, and we'll skip this question as we, we sort of answered it before. Um, Dr. Frakes, how would you simulate this patient if setting, him up, setting her up for radiation therapy? Yeah, so, so at our institution, we, we simulate these patients prone, meaning on their stomach. And part of the reason we do prone, and there's, it's on a belly board, so there's kind of a hole cut out in the center for their abdomen to kind of fall into. Um, and the rationale for that is it tries to have the small bowel, because gravity does a great thing, put it closer to the floor and away from their, their rear. Um, and I also have these patients come in with a comfortably full bladder. Um, and the rationale for that is I think of a, the bladder like a balloon. So if that balloon is full, you're treating less of the, the bladder. And if that balloon is empty, it's kind of squished down. And so the majority of that bladder is gonna get radiation. So that would um, increase some of the side effects, which we'll talk about for this type of radiation. So I treat this, I simulate them prone on a belly board um, and I do give contrast. Um, and so part of it for the treatment fields is you're gonna be um, treating the lymph nodes. And so the, this, the IV contrast helps with delineation of your lymph nodes at risk. Um, and so that's how we do that. And, and to add the complexity, I know Dr. Raldo explained that at their institution, they do a lot of short course. Um, at our institution, we tend to do long course chemo radiation because we do a lot of potential non-operative management. Um, and so we tend to do more um, long course chemo radiation. Dr. Raldo, what would be your, your typical treatment volumes? Sure, so um, when we think about treatment volumes for rectal cancer, we have to think about the risk of where um, there could be a potential for microscopic spread. Um, so that typically involves uh, both, you know, the disease that we see, uh, gross disease that we see, in addition to some elective volumes, um, mostly um, elective volumes address uh, disease that could be in lymph nodes. So we usually start at the bifurcation of uh, the common iliac arteries, and uh, we treat presacral lymph nodes, uh, the internal iliac lymph nodes, and then the entire mesorectum. And of course, there's potential for variation to our target volumes, depending on if you know, the disease is invading into genital urinary structures, um, or if we see an, a node um, that's, you know, not within our treatment volume. But that is um, generally the treatment volumes that we end up including. Um, in order to account for daily changes uh, in potential for bladder filling, as well as rectal filling, gas, etc., cetera, um, we will, uh, in, encompass uh, part of the posterior bladder um, into the treatment volume just so that we don't miss something on a daily basis. Great. Um, and, and Dr. Henke, could you, could you tell us how you might draw blocks on this patient? Yeah, so um... I actually use CT guided volumes. Um, so much like Dr. Raldo was just describing, what I typically do is delineate out that um, elective nodal volume, as well as the uh, entire mesorectum um, using the CT simulation. And then um, from there, we'll make blocks that fit that field. Typically at WashU, we're using a four field box approach, which just means that there are beams coming in from each side laterally, and then also a matched AP and PA beam. Um, what that typically ends up looking like is, is what you can see here, um, where the lateral field, um, you can see that it's covering the sacrum posteriorly, so tracking along behind the sacrum. Yeah, thank you, Chris, for the real-time mouse show. I appreciate it. Um, you can see that the entire mesorectum is encompassed 
we're starting the top of our field at that bifurcation of the, the commons, um, which is usually in the realm of L5S1 inner space. Um, and then going down, um, people tend to think classically it ends up being around the level of the obturator for Raymond. Um, but if you have a higher rectal cancer, you're really just trying to cover the entire mesorectum with a bit of a margin. And so you may not need to go quite as low as the obturator foramen in many cases and can help spare some skin in doing so. And then I was also just gonna jump in and answer that question about the risk of chemo radiation affecting integrity of, of tissues to make surgery more complicated. Um, you know, that um, we do have an effect on the tissues that we treat and certainly that effect can be apparent at the time of, of surgery. Although the timing of surgery after radiation is, is usually placed such that any acute inflammation is, is not present. Um, there can be some minor fibrotic changes. Typically the surgeons don't have too much trouble with it. They're pretty well accustomed to it. And actually, although in theory that can slightly increase surgical risks, um, the risks of complications are actually higher if you do radiation after surgery than if you do it before surgery. And that has to do with um, what, I can't remember who mentioned it already, but the idea that um, when you do this surgery, you're removing actually much of the irradiated tissues. And so you're not leaving behind as many um, uh, kind of scarred or fibrotic tissues or adding scarring to surgical anastomoses and things like that. So it's actually safer to give the chemo radiation up front as well as more effective, so. Great. Um, and Dr. Frakes, could you tell us how you review a treatment plan? Sure. So I think, you know, I usually tell our residents to, to go about it in a systematic uh, systematic process. And so, you know, the first thing that you look at in my mind, we usually kind of joke of like, we should chop that plan. So for the C is kind of coverage. So are we, what is the coverage that we're getting here? So you look at, and I think we talked a little bit about the GTV, or you saw on the slide, GTV, CTV, and PTV. So the GTV is the gross tumor, what you see on the scan, and that's what's in red. Um, and then there's the CTV, which is what you don't see on the scan, but where you suspect there is microscopic spread of disease. And then there's the PTV, which is your planning target, which is allowing for a setup variation, day-to-day -day, uh, small changes. And so I usually tell the residents, let's look at the coverage of the PTVs, but also look at the coverage of the GTV and CTVs. So that's kind of the first thing. Then the H is hotspots. There's, you know, you want the plan to be as homogeneous as possible, but it's not. And there's going to be some hotspots in the field. Um, so where are those hotspots? Is it in the tumor? Is it in small bowel that's normal? Is it in the bladder? And so kind of getting idea of where those hotspots are um, is another thing to look at. And then the O for organs at risk. So the bladders in that area, um, small bowel potentially, the femoral heads or the, the sacrum. So areas where there potentially could be side effects or long-term complications. So looking at what are the organs at risk? What are they getting? Are you happy with that? Are those safe uh, doses? And then the last is the prescription. Just the last thing is always double check the prescription and make sure that what you're trying to achieve is actually being delivered. Um, so that's kind of my approach to doing that. And you always look at the isodose lines, which you can see the different lines there. And it looks like this was also treated similarly, similarly how Dr. Hankey had mentioned with you know fields coming from different directions. So you can kind of see the low dose, um, which is that larger volume. And then the prescription dose, um, I think is in yellow on this field, which is probably right around where that PTV is. So that's my approach to, to looking at the plan. Great. Um, Dr. Raldo, what are some of the early and late toxicities that you see? Yeah, so um, with respect to early toxicities or toxicities that we see during treatment, uh, they're typically, besides fatigue, which happens or can happen to anyone who receives radiation therapy anywhere, um, they are typically related to where we're treating. So you have to think about, you know, what's inside your treatment field, uh, which of course ends up being the rectum, the bowel, the bladder. Um, and uh, th that's what we think about for sh short-term toxicity. So it's possible that patients can have a little bit of gastrointestinal upset or diarrhea. Uh, it's possible that uh, patients can have a little bit of nausea, especially if they're doing concurrent chemo, which also tends to cause nausea. Um, 
And uh, it's also possible that you have some skin in the field, um, especially if you're treating a lower rectal cancer um, where you need to cover the anal canal. Uh, and th there will be skin um, irritation or um, skin reaction, which can manifest as, or you can think of as similar to a sunburn where um, it can get a little bit of redness um, and irritation. Very uncommonly do you see any kind of blistering of skin or skin breakdown for rectal cancer, uh, but it's a possibility. Um, so I would say those are common, the common ones. Rarely we also see some um, irritation to the bladder, um, which can manifest itself as uh, urinary frequency or having to use the bathroom a little bit more often. Rarely there would be any burning with urination from radiation in this case. And then for late toxicity, uh, a lot of these patients will go to surgery. So a lot of the tissue um, will be taken out. Um, they're always worried in, in surgery about, you know, risk of anastomotic leaks. So that's why, anastomotic leaks. So that's why they usually um, give patients a temporary ileostomy uh, before hooking all the bowel back together. Um, in addition, you know, patients who get radiation to the pelvis, uh, if it's a woman, they could potentially have some sexual dysfunction or a risk of vaginal stenosis, uh, especially if it's a lower rectal cancer. So sometimes, uh, or, you know, when, that, when that's a possibility, we talk about vaginal dilator use. Um, there is a risk of infertility uh, with radiation to women. Uh, who are premenopausal. So oftentimes, unfortunately, you will um, render patients menopausal with radiation um, and therefore infertile. Um, and then uh, long-term, there's always an increased risk of um, kind of um, damage to the bones or hips. Uh, or femoral heads usually is one we think about. And then of course, anytime that you give cancer or radiation to anyone with cancer, there's always a, a chance of um, that person developing secondary malignancy from the radiation itself, although that's very rare. Uh, I should just say that, you know, generally these patients recover well from the radiation therapy and the risk of any long-term side effects that are, you know, really, um, manifesting clinically is, is pretty rare. Great. Um, so we uh, did chemo radiotherapy and there's um, some treatment response with a two centimeter mass, um, T3, now eight millimeters from the mesorectal fascia. Um, and there's um, a treat response in the, the lymph nodes, but with about three nodes that were pathologically enlarged. Um, the patient underwent low anterior resection, uh, diverting loop ileostomy um, with a 1.6 centimeter residual tumor uh, with, with widely negative margin and, and no involved lymph nodes. Underwent adjuvant K-POX. Um, and then um, as Dr. Raldo mentioned, um, they did a loop ileostomy takedown after healing. So some of the discussion points that we that we really talked about, but I'd um, love to hear your opinion. And Dr. Henke, would you mind discussing uh, kind of the controversy or discussion about a short and long course uh, yeah. and how that interacts with total new adjuvant and organ preservation? Sounds good. So short course radiation, just to kind of recap and remind everybody is, is a five day course of radiation. So given five business days in a row, typically to a dose of 25 gray in five fractions. Um, whereas long course radiation is the more traditional paradigm historically of doing um, around five and a half weeks or so of radiation with concurrent chemotherapy. Um, and that's kind of a lightweight chemotherapy that's just intended to help make the radiation work a bit stronger. Um, when a person is doing total neoadjuvant therapy, in other words, getting their radiation and that chemotherapy up ahead of surgery, um, you can consider doing either short course radiation or long course radiation ahead of that chemotherapy course. And we don't actually know as a field if either of these is better than the other in this total neoadjuvant paradigm 
or if they're just oncologically equivalent. I personally suspect that they're probably equivalent from an oncologic perspective. Um, but um, one of them is, is a bit easier logistically for patients and has been what we've historically done at WashU, which is short course radiation therapy, um, just because, because many of our patients travel from a great distance, especially uh, where I am in St. Louis, uh, patients can come from all over the Midwest, and it's a little bit less of a population-dense area, so people often travel several several hours to us um, or more. And so having five days of radiation as opposed to a more extended course is just uh, a more logistically sensible regimen for them. Um, in the setting of the Rapido study that um, I think Dr. Raldo mentioned earlier as well, um, that was a study that looked at doing short course radiation followed by chemo and then surgery versus doing long course chemo radiation, surgery, and then chemo. So it wasn't comparing short versus long, but what that did show was that in patients who had really high risk features, like a lot of lymph nodes or big bulky tumors, that adding the chemo up ahead of the surgery actually reduce their risk of having distant metastases form down the line. And so because that's been a big study internationally, um, there's kind of increasing comfort with using short course with chemo up ahead of surgery, just because that's what's been used in this big, otherwise successful clinical trial. So a lot of times, if there are things that are possibly equivalent in radiation oncology, what people will end up doing is what's been most recently done on a large randomized clinical trial. Awesome. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll skip the remaining points and move on. So Chris, do you want uh, me to answer briefly the questions that came through? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. I actually am not seeing them. That's so, okay, yeah. so I'll be really brief. So the first question was, would one consider a procedure such as chemoembolizations or ablations? And so um, in that situation, you know, that's usually in, in would be for liver um, treatment. And so if a patient had an oligometastatic or one to three liver lesions, um, you could consider doing ablations or percutaneous ablations um, to get rid of the areas of metastatic disease. Um, and chemoembolization could potentially be used if there's multiple liver lesions and then you want to try to control those, um, potentially not in a curative setting like you can consider for oligometastatic disease. And then the last question was related to was, or were you able to spare, spare the uh, sphincter? And I think one of the key points that Chris had put in the first physical examination is that rectal tone was really good, meaning that the sphincters were not compromised initially. And if you looked on the MRI, um, it was also not, I think it was a few centimeters away from the sphincters. And so in that situation um, with neoadjuvant therapy, they were able to uh, spare the sphincter in this case. Great, thank you. Those are great questions. Um, so this next case, we have a 66 year old man uh, who presents to your clinic. Um, with a uh, self-palpable anal mass and bright red blood per rectum. And he has two, type 2 diabetes, um, otherwise really non-contributory history. And he's widowed. Um, he, although previously had uh, high-risk sexual behavior, um, worked in the rodeo industry and smoked for a pack, uh, about 20, 20 pack years and has a history of IV drug use. And on physical exam, you find an exophytic mass extending outside the anal canal. There's a lot of pain, um, but good rectal tone and no palpable inguinal adenopathy. Um, so he, um, you do an HIV screen and he was positive and you're firm to ID. Um, you order the proctoscopy, colonoscopy, which shows a fixed ulcerated mass um, extending five centimeters superiorly from the anal verge. Um, and it's non-obstructive, as we discussed previously. And the biopsy shows that it's a P16 positive uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So um, I think we're back to Dr. Uh, Raldo. Uh, what risk factors um, are important to, to discuss and think about for anal yeah, cancer? Sure. So uh, for anal cancer, which is typically um, associated with HPV, um, it's important to just ask general risk factor about a history of genital warts, high risk uh, sexual behavior, uh, which can expose you to both HIV and um, HPV. Um, and um, also if it's a female asking about recent PAPs, 
um, as well as recent history of anal pap smears if they happen to have those. Um, patients who, or men who have sex with men who are HIV positive are generally the most vulnerable population to getting anal cancer, but that's not saying that it can't happen to anyone and everyone. Um, but generally, the, the history of genital warts and high-risk sexual behavior is really important to ask about. Great. Um, and Dr. Hickey, what, what imaging do you typically order on these folks? So uh, at WashU, our typical um, workup is often um, beyond just doing their endoscopy or proctoscopy exam. They'll frequently have come in already with something like a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis, or a CT of the abdomen, pelvis based on their, their symptoms. Um, but what I look to get in addition to that typically is a PET CT, a whole body FDG PET. Um, that is helpful not only in helping delineate the extent of the primary tumor, but also evaluating for any lymph node involvement. Um, CT is a bit less sensitive than PET in the sense that people can have lymph nodes that are involved by their cancer that may not be um, grossly abnormal in terms of size on CT. Um, and, and PET tends to be the most useful in, in evaluating that as well as any risk of distant metastatic disease. Um, I do occasionally get pelvic MRI on anal cancer patients, and I know that um, there's some practice variation. Some people will almost always get an MRI and, and less often a PET. Um, for me, uh, MRI is useful if I'm trying to assess um, any questions of local invasion. For instance, um, on, a, on a woman with an anterior anal cancer, I'll certainly be doing a very careful pelvic exam. Um, also knowing that despite how wonderful our colleagues are in other disciplines, you out, can't ever depend on somebody else to, to fully examine the patient. So definitely always get a pelvic exam, but there may be involvement of say part of the, the vaginal wall in a woman and you may not be able to see on their actual vaginal exam that involvement because it may not be all the way uh, transluminal. Um, and so that helps you to assess not only your target volumes, but then risk of, of long-term toxicities. Like if that tumor then went all the way away, could it leave a defect in the vaginal wall and that type of thing? So for me, um, MRI is more of kind of a local disease refinement help, whereas I use PET more frequently, but there is variability there between people and institutions for sure. So we did order a PET CT. It shows a 4.3 centimeter mass in the uh, in the anal canal, and there's a 1.6 centimeter right inguinal node um, that's depicted here, as well as a, a 1.5 centimeter um, external iliac node. Um, we actually talked about PET CT, so we can move on. Um, so, Dr. Uh, Frakes, what would be your general treatment recommendation? Yeah, so, so for anal cancer, you know, years ago, we used to do surgery for these patients, which would leave them with a permanent colostomy. And then there were some initial studies looking at a lower dose of preoperative uh, chemo radiation and found that these patients actually had complete pathologic, complete responses. And so that really made the paradigm shift to consider primary chemo radiation to uh, preserve um, bowel function. And so you're looking at um, their quality of life and, and normal uh, function. So I would recommend chemo radiation in this patient with uh, locally advanced anal cancer. Awesome. Uh, and Dr. Raldo, um, why is concurrent chemo necessary and, um, and, and how does it work and how do you guys use it in your practice? Yeah, so um, there have been studies comparing radiation alone to chemo radiation. These studies are quite old. Um, chemo radiation has been the standard of care uh, for a while now, at least since the 1970s, I believe, uh, before I was born anyway. Um, and it does improve cancer outcomes. So um, it's important if you want to uh, give patients the best chance for cure to include concurrent chemotherapy. Now, um, this you know general standard of care for chemotherapy uh, includes infusional 5-FU and mitomycin C. However, um, there are institutions that don't use mitomycin C, um, 
And uh, the reason for that is because mitomycin C also happens to be very toxic uh, and patients really have a hard time with it. Uh, oftentimes there are in, institutions that use uh, 5 of and cisplatin, for instance. Um, or if a patient's very old, um, has very poor performance status, I've even seen um, people use, you know, concurrent um, uh, oral 5-FU, which is known as Zolota or Cape Cytobine. Um, but it tends to sensitize um, the patient uh, to the radiation therapy and is very important um, to include. Here at UCLA, we use, as I mentioned, um, both uh, five, uh, infusional 5-FU and mitomycin C in, in most cases. That's great. Um, Dr. Hanke, how, how would you simulate this patient? So I would simulate this patient um, for, in, for anal cancer in general at WashU. We've moved towards simulating these patients um, supine rather than prone. Um, and that has to do with the type of planning that we use for anal cancer patients as opposed to, to rectal cancer patients. So we spent a little time already talking about how in rectal cancer you're using frequently kind of simple beam designs um, with a couple of beams coming in from a few directions and your target is a bit lower and, and doesn't um, need to include as, as far of anterior lymph node chains in most cases as you would in anal cancer where you're going to include the inguinals. And so in anal cancer you use a plan technique typically called intensity modulated radiation therapy, um, which to keep it simple is basically much fancier. And so we're able to better spare um, bowel and things that we otherwise uh, try to avoid by using prone positioning. Um, in this case, supine, the reason that I personally favor that in the anal cancer patients is um, having the patient supine um, reduces the risk that they'll have groin skin breakdown. So the inguinal regions um, can otherwise, if they're um, prone, have more skin folding and then a, a, what's called a bolusing effect from the immobilization devices themselves a bit. And that can result in a greater area of, of skin peeling and, and quite painful skin breakdown. And so by having them supine, you help to avoid that at least in, in the groin region. It's pretty unavoidable in most patients in the perianal region where their primary tumor is but at least we can minimize the, the grain breakdown. Um, that's important, not just for their pain, um, as, as skin breakdown is one of the most challenging complications of chemo radiation and anal cancer, but also because like uh, Dr. Raldo mentioned, mitomycin C can really be toxic and reduce patients' blood counts. And so if they have a lot of open skin when they become neutropenic or other um, considerations like that, can put them at more risk of infection too. So. We've been moving towards um, more supine simulation as opposed to prone and, and for those reasons. But I think you could still do prone and not be incorrect. Chris, maybe we could skip these treatment planning slides for the interest of time and just go, yeah. And then um, there's a good question for the panelists in the Q&A. Um, maybe they can comment on T1 and zero anal cancer management at their institutions really briefly. I can comment. Um, so a little bit depends on if it's the T1N0 uh, cancer is in the anal canal itself or if it's a perianal cancer, meaning um, kind of more of a skin type cancer. Um, so if it's in the anal canal itself here, uh, we usually go with um, concurrent chemo radiation. That's a standard according to the NCCN guidelines, although I will say um, that um, there have been studies out there looking at radiation alone uh, for T1 and 0 cases, and uh, it's not unreasonable to just do radiation therapy alone. These cases, T1 and 0, haven't been included in any of the major trials, so the data there is really lacking. Um, if it's a perianal cancer, meaning you know more on the skin as opposed to in the anal canal, uh, then we ask our surgeons if they can excise it with good margin. Yeah, the only caveat I'll add is that we there is a controversy sometimes of one versus two doses of 5-FU mitomycin C. And so in these T1 and zeros, we tend to usually do just one dose of chemo instead of two, but it kind of just depends if it's like 
almost a T2 um, N0 or a very small T1 N0. So there can be some variations to that as well. That's great. Good, good questions. Um, we will move on and just try to, to go through this last case. Oh, I don't think, points. Chris, I don't oh, think no. we'll have time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, but um, we were able to um, cover the lower GI cancers for all the students. There's still a whole uh, range of upper GI cancers we haven't covered, but, you know, join Radonc residency to learn more about that. Um, maybe we can get to the last few slides. And Jenna was able to um, join us, so she can help Hi. wrap up. Yes. Um, so I want to say thank you to all the panelists. I know you guys did a wonderful job. Um, please do the post survey. Um, there will be four um, Amazon gift cards um, that we'll do as a raffle um, for each session. So please try and do the post session survey. Um, it should be very quick. Um, please, um, next slide, look at our website which is radonkvirtual.com. Um, you can always um, send us an email if you're interested in, uh, or you have any questions. Um, and then we had a few announcements. Um, next slide. Um, the Swaro Society of Women in Radish Oncology um, wanted us to um, promote and let you all know that um, they are a group that um, was started a few years ago um, to promote women in radiation oncology um, and open to medical student mentorship. You can go to the next slide. Um, and um, you, it's a free membership, so anyone can get involved with that. Um, so um, please take a look at SWORO, S-W-R-O. Next slide. And um, there's a website, which obviously you guys can't click on, um, but I bet if you Google SWORO, um, you may be able to find it. Um, Society for Women in Radiation Oncology. There's also a Twitter and a Facebook. We can go to the next slide. Um, Dr. Henke can um, announce this as well. Yeah, so um, just wanted to mention that there is um, at WashU and I know also at other institutions too, um, away rotation opportunities that are really hoping to help to support um, a diverse background of, of students applying into radiation oncology. So um, we have a, an away rotation DICOMS that is, has a fully funded away rotation opportunity um, with a stipend. And really um, the goal is to try to help offset the expense of, of kind of traditionally sometimes expensive away rotations. And um, if you're out there and you're a fourth year med student and really interested in, in trying to learn more about the field, I would really encourage you to check out this opportunity and, and others like it and don't feel discouraged by um, what might seem like otherwise challenging barriers to accessing opportunities like this. So thanks, Jenna. Great. Um, and then next slide. Um, and also to go along with that, um, on the website, we try to update anyone who has virtual rotations um, and um, in-person rotations. Um, next up is in two weeks, July 9th. So after the 4th of July holiday, we'll be doing CNS and pediatrics. Um, so please sign up for that. And 